Ciao. Is it on now? Yeah, okay. All right. I had no idea Gentry was this popular. Um, anyway, before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about the lecture series uh, for which this is the inaugural talk, right? So we're kicking off a lecture series called the, uh, the Frontline Lecture Series Inside uh, an Innovative Mind. Yeah, this lecture series comes to you um, from the people who do the front end of the business here at JPL. Uh, and, you know, it is guys with our scientists, technologists, engineers who conceive and incubate and nurture uh, missions that become the JPL missions of the future. And I think it is really their innovations that keeps us in business. So what we thought of doing, I have no idea whether this thing will be successful or not, but I'm aiming a little bit high. Um, I'm going to try to bring people to JPL probably twice a year, people who are known to be an innovator uh, in their own field, not necessarily all from aerospace. You know, we I've, I've talked with Caltech and we're thinking about, uh, you know, like Frank Gehry in architecture, George Lucas, you know, in digital animation, Stephen Jobs, uh, Richard Branson, um, Ted Turner, all of them, you know, if they come and don't charge us anything, <laughs> <laughs> which is the key thing. And uh, so uh, I first started with someone that I knew wasn't going to charge me. Uh, at least that's what he said. Uh, so anyway, uh, let me uh, introduce to you, not that it needs much of an introduction, um, but I'm going to tell you about his non-engineering function because we all know Gentry, of course. Uh, his fingerprints is all over uh, the, you know, the stuff that JPL has done for years and years. Um, so uh, let me, I'm going to read you the summary of the summary of his bio, which then I summarized. Uh, okay, so uh, of course, in addition to his work, uh, Gentry has been an active novelist. Uh, television producer, computer game designer, media columnist, and a, um, a lecturer. He, uh, in between 1989 and 1994, he co-authored with uh, Arthur C. Clarke, which you all know, uh, four um, uh, science fiction that they all became New York Times bestsellers, and they've been translated into 20 languages. And s since his work with uh, Arthur C. Clarke, he has written three more uh, uh, novel equally, uh, solo novels equally as uh, successful. Uh, one of the things that many of you guys may know Gentry, uh, if you're a bit, little bit older like me, uh, from 1976 to 1981, uh, he was a partner for Carl Sagan, uh, that they work in creation, design, development, and implementation of Cosmos, which as you know became the uh, all-time best science documentary. Uh, Cosmos was uh, um, won many uh, Emmys and also was uh, won the uh, Peabody Award. Um, from 1995 to 1999, in his spare time, he dabbled in uh, becoming chief in, uh, designer for commercial computer products. Uh, one of them, a role-playing adventure game named Rama, and the other one, an encyclopedia for solar system entitled Exploring uh, the Planets. Uh, Gentry has received the NASA uh, Medal of Exceptional Scientific Achievement in 1976, I assume for the work that he did on Viking. Uh, also, he has received the uh, Distinguished Service Medal, which is the NASA's highest award, and he uh, got that in 2005. And last year, he won the uh, prestigious Harold Mazursky Award that the American Astronomical Society uh, hands out, the, the, the Planetary Division, and that was for a lifetime achievement. Uh, in planetary exploration. Um, beside all of that, uh, you, you know, Gentry has uh, managed to have seven sons, um, and uh, he is fluent in uh, English and Italian, and I think in a pinch he can tell the taxi driver in about five or six different languages on how to get him to the nearest bar. Uh, <laughs> so here is the uh, Mr. Triple Seven, seven books, seven sons, and seven languages. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gentry Lee. Okay, we'll check the mic first, make sure it's working. You can all hear me fine? Yep. All right. What are we going to do today? We're going to have fun and we're going to learn something. 
I'm going to share some points of view. You'll agree with them, disagree with them, whatever. I want you to, to at least think about them. Now, why am I here, and what am I going to do that's different than when I was up here in June of 2005? In June of 2005, I gave a talk on systems engineering and what attributes you had to have in order to be a good systems engineer. But that entire talk was aimed at how, okay? And it assumed that something was already defined to be engineered, okay? Now, there are two questions that come before that. If what you do is you back off far enough from all the things that we do, the flow of primary questions, if you allow me to invoke that sort of phrase, goes like this. Why, what, and then how, okay? So what I'm going to talk about is what is the system engineer's role when the dominant today, when the dominant questions are why and what? And because everybody likes lists from Letterman to Lee, okay, <laughs> or however you want to do it, I'm going to eventually give you the top 10 attributes of a system engineer who plays in this why what field more than the how field. Now, Somebody said, please don't use any of the same attributes you used for the other guy. Okay, because that, you know, people like to have disjoint sets. I will say to start with, however, that you know, of course, you can't do this job if you don't have intellectual curiosity. And Jeff Leising pointed out to me, you know, it may be obvious to everybody, but you need to say it. This job of being a system engineer in the what and why field is more like being an architect than it is like being an engineer. And it's important that you realize that uh, I tried this on my sons just to see whether or not they understood the difference. And they said, sure, Dad, we understand. The architect designs the building and the engineer builds it. And I said, OK, that's close enough. And that's what we're talking about. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a brief step back because we're going to go to the first attribute. And I'm going to set the context for this entire discussion. Here we come. We're doing the top 10. Number one. Science smart. OK, systems engineers, you can get away with understanding little or nothing about the science you're implementing if you're in the how phase. You cannot if you're in the why and what phase. Your best friend should be a book on geology or planetary science. You should read the journals. You should understand what it is the scientists are trying to achieve. Imagine the evolution of the why questions. You could be out of date, for example, because you only know the questions that were asked about Enceladus four years ago. Hello, there's a whole set of different questions that are being asked right now. Now, I had somebody limp into my office, and they were very upset with me. They said, you expect everybody to be able to do everything. And I said, no, I don't expect them to. I just think they should aspire to. And then he went on and said, I don't know anything about geology. I never took a course in geology. How am I supposed to talk to Dr. So-and-so, who's a PhD at Washington University of St. Louis, about geology? I said, what you do is you simply say, I need to understand, first and foremost, what are the questions? OK? Now, that sounds very, very simple. And yet, I find that many people, when I ask them, they say, I have submission such and such, and this is what I've been designed it to do. I said, what are the questions that this mission is designed to answer? What do you mean? No, I said, there's had to be somebody saying there's issues that I don't know the answer to, like maybe what's the core structure of the moon, or what are the things that are contained in the plumes that are coming off of Enceladus, or something like that in the beginning. Somebody had to tie that to the origin and destiny of the solar system and everything else. If you don't know that, okay, you are handicapped in the early, you know, in, in, in the beginning part, because it is a merger of science and engineering, and it is unfair for you working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to expect the scientists to come more than halfway to you. That's not their job. It is your job to go more than halfway to them. You have to understand the what, why, and then you have to get to the what. How does this all work? What is our business about? It's a simple flow. What are the questions which comes from what are the hypotheses? How do I answer the question? OK? You answer the questions by 
taking observations. Now somebody says, well, there's other ways to answer the questions. I said, yeah, you could go, um. I said, that's not what we do here. We try to have specific ways to answer the questions, which then maps into measurements that need to be taken, instruments that need to be designed, and then it gets more quantitative all the way down there. But this front end process of being science smart means you have to understand what it is they're trying to achieve. Let me give you an example, or several. Right now, we're talking in the future about a New Frontiers missions. And every one of those, the drive behind the mission con